welcome to our continuing 2018 educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Specialist for FIRST Healthcare Compliance. At FIRST Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Lauren Russell, Associate Attorney of Young Conway, Stargat, and Taylor. Lauren represents employers on a range of issues relating to compliance with local, state, and federal employee employment laws and constitutional provisions. She has experience in each of Delaware State Courts, as well as U.S. District Court for the District of Delaware and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Lauren also regularly assists clients in administrative proceedings before state and federal agencies, including the EEOC, the Delaware Office of Anti-Discrimination, and the Delaware Unemployment Insurance Appeals Board. Lauren has litigated a wide variety of employment-related matters to successful resolutions, including cases alleging violations of employment discrimination statutes and state and federal constitutional provisions, non-competition suits, among others. In addition to litigation, Lauren counsels employers on a broad range of topics, including revision of handbooks to ensure compliance with state and federal labor and employment statutes. Lauren also conducts on-site training on legal compliance, including anti-harassment training. Lauren serves as an editor of the Delaware Employment Law Letter, at the only monthly newsletter in Delaware written exclusively for Delaware employers. She speaks annually on a variety of issues at Young Conway's annual employment law seminar. Lauren serves as Lauren served as the 2015-16 Chair of the Delaware State Bar Association's Labor and Employment Section. Lauren is a graduate of Temple University Beasley School of Law, where she was the, article, the Articles Editor of the Temple Political and Civil Rights Law Review, a member of the Women's Law Caucus, and a recipient of the Law Faculty Scholarship. Lauren served as an intern to the Honorable Kent A. Jordan, Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. A copy of the slide deck is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. We will address questions there at the conclusion. Your PACOM CEU certificate will be emailed to you from PACOM following the broadcast. There is no need to request it. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. Lauren, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, that is a kind and lengthy introduction, and <laughs> we'll endeavor to trim that up going forward, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, as, as Catherine indicated, my expertise uh, is in Delaware law, um, but the things that we're going to talk about today are really issues of federal law, and so they're going to be applicable to listeners all over the country. So I want to be clear that, uh, you know, while uh, I'm a Delaware employment attorney and that's where I'm licensed, that the things we're going to talk about today really are equally applicable in every state. But as always, you should consult with your employment counsel uh, if, if you have specific questions. So, um, you know, sexual harassment is illegal under state and federal law in every jurisdiction in, in the country. Um, and, you know, it's a more pervasive issue than I think many of us thought uh, only six months ago. So what we're going to talk about today is sort of the um, the advanced uh, issues in sexual harassment beyond the uh, most sort of basic uh, preparation and considerations that I would consider checking the box, right? So checking the box includes uh, having a, an anti-harassment policy and, um, you know, being aware of your duty to prevent and investigate and remediate harassment in the workplace, right? That's uh, something that I would hope everybody who uh, is responsible for employment issues in the workplace would, would sort of have under their belt at this point. So the question 
question is then, where do we go next? Um, and this is really, uh, a, I mean, it's, it's a hot topic, but more than that, uh, it's a, a pervasive uh, problem that's really coming to the forefront these days. Um, and, and, you know, so we're going to talk about dealing with that in a more in-depth manner. Um, so, what, what, as I said, you know, we sort of have checked the box in the past. I know that uh, I have done many a webinar, uh, including for this organization, I believe, on issues of discrimination and harassment in the workplace. What's the, what's the, what's the baseline, right? What, what is our, uh, our most minimal expectation? One is, you know, having an up-to-date policy. Uh, don't limit yourself to sexual harassment. Um, historically, a lot of organizations had a policy that was literally called sexual harassment policy, and it did not address any of the other types of harassment that occur in the workplace. Now, we're going to be talking today um, almost exclusively about sexual harassment, and even more specifically, we're going to focus a bit on a type of harassment called quid pro quo harassment. I'm going to talk about that more and what that means uh, in a little bit more depth, but you know, that's that's the that's the key issue we're dealing with today. In another year or five years or ten years, it's going to be a different type of harassment. And six months ago, I was seeing a lot more racial harassment than I was sexual harassment. And so I'm going to encourage you to uh, have a policy that addresses every protected characteristic, right? Um, there are things about sexual harassment that are unique. They should get a little bit of extra attention in your policy, but really you need to uh, cover the full gamut of prohibited behavior. Uh, and, and I have said in the past in, in webinars uh, for first healthcare compliance and um, you know in, in others that I, I have a, a good baseline policy that covers all of these things. If you want a copy of it, please feel free to contact me. My contact information is at the end of this slide deck, um, and I have given that policy out to probably hundreds of webinar attendees at this point, um, with the caveat that, of course, you would need to take a critical eye to it and make sure that it suits your needs and that it meets the minimum requirements of your jurisdiction. Um, but it's, it's a, good, a good starting point. So that's issue number one is cover everything. Number two is, uh, you know, it, it is okay to have one general harassment policy and one sexual harassment policy. Um, you can break it out if you wish. Uh, the policy that I use is combined in one, but, you know, this is really a judgment call. Um, so if you are operating under two policies, I just want to assure you that that's perfectly acceptable. Um, but if you have two policies, be consistent between them. We don't do anything for sexual harassment complaints that we wouldn't do for racial harassment or religious harassment, for example. All of those things, all of those protected uh, categories or characteristics, so race, age, skin color, religion, disability, uh, that, that entire gambit, religion, um, is, is all protected. We cannot you know, treat somebody unkindly because of their membership in any of, and, and in any of those groups, excuse me. Um, so we need to be consistent with the way that we handle that. There's, there's nothing more special about sexual harassment or more egregious about sexual harassment than there is about any of those other characteristics. So again, consistent, consistent, consistent. Um, the next issue is be prepared for harassment at the highest levels. This is sort of the, uh, the issue of the day, right? Uh, the, the Harvey Weinsteins of the world are uh, really um, coming under scrutiny right now, and rightly so. Don't don't let anything I say minimize the the severity of the situations that we're seeing in the news. Um, but those are incredibly complex issues, right? Um, when your harasser, your alleged harasser, is able to fire anybody in the organization who questions him or her, that's a very precarious situation for your organization to be in. Uh, so you need to address all of those issues. Um, and there are a couple of ways that we can get at that. And... Um, you know, it, it really depends a lot on the structure of your organization. If you have an office that consists of two doctors and five support staff, and, and that's it, 
that's a very different situation than, for example, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, which is, you know, a massive organization with thousands of employees, right? Um, the way that you're going to manage harassment by senior employees in, in those situations is, is going to be very, very different. Um, when we're dealing with a small organization, uh, you need to prepare the, the the business owners for the possibility that they may be fielding complaints against one another, right? So Dr. A may need to respond to allegations against Dr. B, and that's a very tricky situation, right? Presumably, when you're in a business organization that small, there are deep running personal and emotional ties between everybody that, that works in, in that group. Um, and that's hard. And we're going to talk a little bit further on about how we deal with that. But you've got to be prepared that there are circumstances like that where you're going to sort of need to cordon off members of your management group, right? So Dr. A receives a complaint against Dr. B, Dr. A then needs to sort of cut off information to Dr. B, right? Dr. B is the subject of a harassment investigation at this point, and Dr. A is going to be managing that investigation. As we're going to talk about later, um, Dr. A should be bringing in somebody from outside the organization to help manage that problem at that point. Um, but you know, think about these things, right? What happens if uh, one of our two founding doctors uh, becomes the subject of a harassment investigation? How do we handle that? It's not a one-size-fits-all proposition or solution. So that's our small organization. What do we do with our large organization? Uh, it is easier and infinitely more complex with a large organization. The nice thing about a huge group, a, a company with you know 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 employees, is that you've got a structured human resources department. Very frequently, you'll have an in-house counsel department, uh, and, and they can step in and manage that that process for you. The problem is that there is, of course, um, you know, a very large managerial ladder that these thing that these complaints often have to have to climb. And so when a complaint starts at uh, a fairly low level and has to, you know, go through multiple levels of managers to get to human resources or the legal department, there's a lot of room for things to fall through the cracks. And that is extremely dangerous. Uh, keep in mind uh, that under the law of harassment, as soon as any manager in your organization knows that somebody has made a complaint of harassment, that knowledge is uh, imputed to the entire organization. So at that point, you have a low-level or a mid-level manager who knows about the harassment. The entire company is then presumed to know. And there is no way to rebut that presumption. It is fact for purposes of a, of a future lawsuit. And if that report never makes its way to human resources, then you've got a really difficult situation where a court is going to say, well, the company knew that there was ongoing harassment and did nothing. Well, 99.9% .9 of the organization did not, in fact, know anything, but there was a failure in your management. And that's an issue of training we're going to talk about a little bit further on. But, um, you know, one of the things that you need to consider is you know, assuming that the report makes its way to everybody that it needs to make its way to, what do we do then? Um, and again, this is going to be an issue of training and preparing all of the stakeholders, right? So if there's a complaint against your CEO and you're a large publicly traded organization, then your board of directors needs to be aware of what happens, right? Because they're going to be the ones who step in and make the decision. That's what ultimately happened in the Weinstein case, was that the uh, board of directors stepped in and fired Harvey Weinstein. Uh, he was the head of the studio, and nobody else had the power to do that. So all of these things are things you need to think critically about, and that nobody can sort of tell you how to do because your organization is a unique entity. So. Um, that is sort of our, our fourth bullet point of be prepared, think about how you're going to address these issues. And I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to think about these issues before they come up. 
um, it is much easier to make a plan for the exit of your CEO or your CFO or your COO uh, when they're not actually under fire, right? Um, you could have the best CEO in the entire world, you know, somebody who's committed to the company, fantastically invested and, you know, beloved by the employees. That person can have an ugly dark side that nobody knows about until this information comes out. And it's very difficult to plan for the ouster of somebody that you care about when you're dealing with these conflicted uh, issues of, you know, we respect and love our CEO, but he's alleged to have done these horrible things. And then when we investigated, we found out they were true. That's you know, it's incredibly difficult, right? So it's for the, it, we plan for these things the way that we plan for divorce, right? You sign a prenup thinking we're never going to get divorced. And so you're able to easily and, and amicably negotiate for the end of your marriage uh, when there's absolutely no threat to it. Consider these plans exactly like a prenup. Um, you need to think about the worst possible outcome and then hope, pray, and presume it never comes, but if it does, you are ready. All right, so the last issue that, you know, we sort of think about at the base level is consider confidential reporting methods. If you are a Blue Cross Blue Shield, if you are just a, a behemoth of a company, then uh, consider having a confidential uh, phone number where employees can call and make reports. Um, this provides a shocking level of protection for the organization because the first thing that happens when you when you receive a lawsuit for sexual harassment um, is that you figure out you know what you know about it and very often there's never been a complaint right you the first time you learned about this was when you received a charge of discrimination or notice of a lawsuit um, and the reason you're going to depose the employee and the reason that the employee is going to give is, well, I knew I would be fired if I ever made a complaint. Well, having a confidential reporting method makes it much easier to rebut those allegations, right? Now, it's more difficult in a small office uh, where you only have, you know, five employees. But that, you know, sometimes is an even more valuable time to have these kinds of confidential reporting methods in place. Um, we have one client who has a 1-800 ethics line that actually calls into a dedicated phone line here in my office. Uh, and we have somebody who is assigned to listen to those messages every week uh, and then report them over to human resources so that they can be investigated. Um, and it's entirely up to the employee whether they choose to disclose their name and contact information or not. Um, of course, that makes it a little bit more difficult to investigate because you can't just call them back and say, hey, you didn't tell me the, the last name of the manager. Um, but in a smaller organization, very frequently, you know who the manager is uh, or there's only one Linda or Bob or Susan or Steve in the office. Uh, and so, you know, there, there are ways to manage those kinds of limitations. All right. So. That's your policy and its uh, fundamental aspects. The next question is, how do we conduct our investigations, right? So this is kind of a recap of the uh, prior trainings that I've, that I've done on these issues. We'll go through these relatively quickly. Um, when you are investigating, never ever promise confidentiality. Um, if you have a copy of my policy or request a copy of my policy, you'll see that it has language along the lines of, we will treat the, any report with as much confidentiality as possible consistent with a full and thorough investigation, right? You can't keep things secret because you have to talk to witnesses. And the moment that you tell a witness, hey, there's an allegation of discrimination against manager Michael, um, it, the cat's out of the bag, right? A secret is uh, kept between two people and it's, it's open season once three people know. So, you can't promise that it's going to be confidential. What you can promise is that we will only limit, uh, we will only disclose this information to people who have a legitimate business need to know, right? So the witnesses, the alleged harasser, um, if you are removing somebody from the workplace, then you usually need to tell their manager, hey, they're being placed on a leave of absence, right? Um, any person 
who is informed of these allegations should be given clear instructions that they are not to talk about what you know what they've been told that they may not retaliate against the reporting person individual or any other witness on the basis of what they're told that they need to be absolutely above reproach with regard to the way that they manage this information okay uh, so we identify our witnesses, we uh, gather statements from them, we gather all documents, right? Uh, harassment is frequently conducted online through Facebook uh, or other social media platforms. You want uh, screenshots of, of, you know, any harassing conduct that happens online. Um, keep in mind that in a lot of states, and Delaware is one of them, you cannot force somebody to log into their Facebook account and, uh, you know, disclose information that resides there. Um, but usually when somebody is the victim of harassment, uh, you know, they will have taken a screenshot of that and they'll turn it over. And, and that is something that, that you absolutely want to collect. Um, if there are harassing emails. If a manager is sending sexually suggestive emails to a subordinate, print them out. Keep in mind that anything that is on your computer system belongs to the company, not the employee. So you can absolutely go into somebody's company email account and download uh, copies of their emails. Don't destroy anything. The moment that you have a complaint of harassment or discrimination or retaliation, Anything that could possibly lead to a lawsuit down the road, you have an affirmative obligation to preserve evidence. So gather documents, save the documents, don't destroy anything. Um, interview every witness who has been identified. Ask the witnesses if they know about anyone else, right? So you're building a spider web here. It starts in the middle with one reporter. And they say, well, here are three, this, this is the name of the alleged harasser, and here are three people who, who are aware of the harassment. So you interview the alleged harasser and you say, can you tell me anybody else who, who might know anything about this situation? And they identify some witnesses. And you interview the three other witnesses and they identify some people. And you build out and out and out and out until you're not getting any new names, right? So you want to fully explore the entire span of that spider web and identify every single person who might have touched this incident. Do not worry about hearsay. I get a surprising number of phone calls from clients who say to me, well, we uh, interviewed this witness and that witness and, you know, neither one of, you know, it was, it was just he said, she said, or, um, you know, they, the, it's only rumor and innuendo. They're just gossiping. There's no such here, no such thing as hearsay in the context of a workplace harassment investigation, right? Hearsay is a principle of evidence that applies in court only. You don't need to be worried about whether something would stand up to the test of a jury trial. Your concern is we want to know everything that happened uh, that, that gave rise to this incident. So I would strongly encourage you to talk to everybody and then make a credibility determination. That is your uh, province as a manager, as a supervisor, as an investigator, is to say, I believe person A and I don't believe person B, right? That's okay. Now, if you find yourself in a situation, and this is very frequent, very, very frequent, where person A is telling a very plausible version of events and person B is telling a very plausible version of events. And really, when you put it all together, you say, look, this was a colossal misunderstanding. Person A is a jerk and person B was deeply insulted and wounded, but this was not an issue of harassment or discrimination. That happens. That happens a lot. And that's OK. You don't have to say, I believe person A or and I don't believe person B. You can say, look, I believe both of them actually experienced these events the way that they describe, but the truth lies somewhere in the middle. That is also well within your province. Okay, have an aide present. Any single, any interview you do, there should be a third person in the room acting as a witness, and it's that person's responsibility to take notes, and they should be meticulous notes, okay? Uh, the notes should have a date, a great way to accomplish this is actually to record things in an email and send the email to yourself. 
Uh, and that way you've got a date and a timestamp right there on the document. That's an excellent option. It's a question I get a lot. What about recording? Um, the first thing I will say is that there are many states in this country where you have to have the permission of every person to a conversation before you can record it. That is called being a two-party consent state. Do not record anything unless you know that you are either a one-party consent state, which means that only one person to the conversation has to give permission. And that, that it means, in essence, that you can secretly record things. So either know that you're a one-party consent state or get the permission of everybody in the room. I will personally say I, I don't recommend recording these kinds of conversations. Um, it rarely works to the benefit of, of the employer. Um, now, there are lots of people who will disagree with me, and so that's really a judgment call that you make. That's just the, the position that I've come to. All right. The follow-up after the investigation. What do we do after? You meet with the accuser and the accused, and you tell them what it is that you have decided. We have, con we have you know, reviewed all of the evidence and met with all the witnesses, and we think person A harassed person B. We reviewed all the evidence, and we think person A did not harass person B. Um, whatever the outcome is, document it in writing and explain in detail why it is that you reached that conclusion. And provide guidance even if the claim of harassment is unsubstantiated, right? These incidents don't arise because two people were super duper nice to each other. These incidents arise when somebody was an unmitigated jerk for no good reason, right? Or an unmitigated jerk for a good reason, but we just don't behave that way in the workplace. That's not the place to be a jerk and a bully, even if it's totally legal. So we find ourselves in this situation where we've got, we're at loggerheads, um, person A and person B are now casting, you know, allegations at each other. Get it under control, even if it's not illegal discrimination, right? Person A, you need to speak respectfully to person B going forward. We did not find that you had engaged in sexual harassment. Nonetheless, the language that you used was inappropriate and unprofessional, and you are not to speak to person B that way going forward things along those lines, right? Just because it's not illegal doesn't mean that you can't lower the hammer. Give clear warnings on retaliation to uh, the managers involved, to the alleged harasser. Everybody involved should be told in no uncertain terms, you may not take adverse action against this person because they made this complaint, okay? No managers should be disciplining that alleged victim for three to six months without input from human resources. If you don't have a human resources professional on staff, you should be speaking with an attorney. Uh, the reason is that following harassment allegations, we frequently see complaints of retaliation. And the window for retaliation under most state and federal law is about three months, right? We want to get clear of that window. So we want to be making very, very good managerial decisions for three to six months following a report. And also give clear instructions to all of your witnesses and to your alleged victim that they have an ongoing duty to report, right? Uh, if you, whether, whether it's substantiated or not, it does not matter. If you experience harassment, if you experience further uh, or retaliation, discrimination, you must come back and tell us and we will again investigate the situation. All right. Monitor the situation. I have a client who uh, had a very contentious situation with a manager and a subordinate. She investigated it and found that this was a personality conflict. Manager was a bully. Subordinate was, frankly, insubordinate. And so everybody had done something wrong. But, you know, we had a real situation where the manager needed more training and the subordinate needed guidance on appropriate workplace behavior. And then everybody else in that department had been so affected by this toxic work situation that they were all very unhappy. So manager, uh, my, my HR manager said, look, I'm going to sit down and have meetings with these individuals um, at three months out, six months out, and 12 months out to make sure that everybody in that department is happier and more comfortable. I said, that is the most responsible, professional treatment of the situation that I could imagine. And I promptly told her I was going to steal her plan and put it in all of my presentations going forward. Because I think that it is so important that we monitor these situations uh, and, and really ensure that we don't 
perpetuate a toxic environment just because it's not unlawful harassment, right? Our employees should be happy when they come to work to the extent that we can make them that way. All right, so all of that said, what's the next step? Where are we going with this? The first is that we have got to prioritize annual or biannual training, by which I mean that training should happen once every year or once every two years at the outside, right? I have so many clients who t come to me and say, well, you know, Lauren, you reviewed our handbook three years ago. We never really put it into place. So can you review it again? And I'm thinking, why did you spend the money, right? You can't waste your time and money spinning your wheels on these things until you have a real problem in the workplace. This needs to be a priority. I will tell you that the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and every state uh, anti-discrimination agency looks at these issues. When you get a complaint against you, one of the first things they're going to ask is, show us your policy, and when was the last time you did training? Were the people here trained on these issues and how to behave appropriately, appropriately in the workplace? This is a huge prophylactic measure that you can take that very few companies really stay on top of. It is time to start staying on top of that issue. Who does your training? Bring in an outsider. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to bring somebody in from the outside. Um, any HR managers on the phone, any in-house counsel on the phone listening to this will have personal experience with all of the times that you have been ignored or sort of uh, ridden over uh, because you work for the company, right? And so your boss sort of makes a decision because he makes the decision on all of these kinds of things and he's your boss. Um, but really, you know, you're the expert. You have a very niche uh, set of experiences with this organization and this body of law and these issues, and they should be respected. You should be respected. But unfortunately, when you're inside the organization, very often that is not the case. So bring in somebody from the outside. As frustrating as it is, an outside HR specialist or attorney uh, very often gets the kind of attention that we need in these cases that your inside people just can't get. So vet your trainer. Check them out online. See if they've got any uh, training seminars up on YouTube that you can listen to. Um, you want somebody who's engaging, who is serious about these issues, um, but you don't want a dry, boring presentation, right? Nobody should be saying to you, here are the three elements of a claim for discrimination. Let's talk about the prima facie case, right? If somebody is using Latin terms during their training, that's not really the person for you. Um, and that's not to say that they're not a fantastic human resources professional or a fantastic attorney, uh, but you need to have the attention of everybody in that room. How do we make the training stick? Leadership buy-in, right? Your CEO, your CFO, your COO, the founding members of the, of the medical practice, the doctors who uh, run this business, need to believe in this, and you need to explain to them why this is important. We are seeing settlements of harassment cases in the tens of millions of dollars, and we're seeing $100 million jury verdicts in the really egregious cases. Uh, this is truly an existential threat to businesses right now, and the decision makers in your company need to understand that. They need to then demonstrate their understanding by sending an email or standing up at the beginning of the presentation and saying, hi, my name is Bob or Sue, and I am the CEO of this company or the uh, vice president managing this division of the company, and I want you to listen to this training today. This is important. The company cares about these issues, and we are going to uh, really be emphasizing this going forward, right? Uh, the significance that that has on your staff and employees cannot be overstated. To show that this is an issue taken seriously by the organization is incredibly important. Conversely, if you do everything that I have told you to do, everything that I'm going to tell you to do, and you have a CEO who cracks jokes and makes inappropriate statements through the training, 
that completely destroys the efficacy of that training and that will come up in a lawsuit or a charge of discrimination. If you are uh, trying to defend a charge and you say, look, we train everybody every six months, every three months, we make them train on sexual harassment every single morning when they come into the office. And then the employee says, yeah, well, they do train us every single day, but you know what? The CEO makes inappropriate sexual jokes every single day at lunch. That is going to override all of that training. It is so very, very important that the company, uh, in appearance and in fact, takes these issues seriously. Another way that you can demonstrate that is having your senior leadership lead by example during training. One of the most impactful trainings I ever did was uh, with a senior leadership team and the first person to raise his hand and ask questions on every single topic I addressed was the head of that leadership team. Uh, he asked great, thoughtful questions and really showed that he was engaged. And you know what? His staff looked at that and they really bought into that training. And I'm incredibly confident that that's going to be a better workplace as a result of the strong leadership that was shown by the head of that leadership team. That uh, is something that's going to stick with me for a very long time and something that I wish that I could show to uh, every single one of my clients. That's the type of leadership we need on these issues. Um, to that end, monitor your attendees. First of all, every single person in the organization should be uh, signing in and signing out so that you have written proof that they attended this. And they should be focused and serious. Nobody should be falling asleep in the back of the classroom. Uh, nobody should be cracking jokes. I recently did a training uh, on a, a workplace training for managers on harassment and discrimination. And I said, look, there are a couple of words that I don't want anybody using in the workplace anymore. Nobody should be calling anybody retarded. Nobody should be saying to anybody, that's so gay. Those are teenage insults that are not appropriate in the workplace. And the head of that organization leaned over and cracked a joke to somebody and said, yeah, well, this guy over here is retarded. He's got the worst job in the business. That is completely inappropriate and really is exactly the opposite of, of, of what, what we want to be emphasizing here, right? That is a situation where human resources should be pulling that manager aside and saying, you know, we need to have a discussion about this. You know, we went to all of the time and effort to have somebody do this training and you essentially popped the balloon, right? You let the air out of the room and completely undermined the importance of, uh, of, of everything that was being said by engaging in exactly the kind of behavior that we're trying to, to stamp out right now. Um, you know, those are hard discussions to have. And it's a very hard discussion to have when it's your boss who's behaving that way. But it's a discussion that absolutely needs to be had. All right. So, all of that said, um, it should go without saying we train every single person in the organization from your janitor to your CEO, and if you have board members, they should be trained too. Keep in mind our Harvey Weinstein situation, right? Uh, it was his board of directors who removed him, and if a member of your board receives a complaint of, of, of sexual or any other type of harassment against a member of your senior leadership, you need to be able to count on them to do the appropriate thing, right? They need to know, if I get a complaint, who do I tell? How are we managing this, right? Uh, if there's a complaint against your CEO, is it going to be managed by the personnel committee of your board of directors? Uh, is it going to be, a, will you convene an ad hoc committee for every complaint? Uh, these are, you know, tough questions. And, you know, frankly, the history of your organization is going to inform the answer to a, a, a significant extent. But these are discussions that need to be had, and they're really discussions that should include your at least your chief human resources uh, officer, whoever that may be, uh, so that you can figure out um, what what's going to happen. All right, so what do we do in a practical sense when we're investigating executives and your human resources managers, right? Human resources is almost always the group that's tasked with investigating these kinds of allegations. What happens if it's your chief human resources officer who's accused of discrimination or harassment? That's a very tricky thing. It's 
almost as tricky as when it's your CEO. What do we do? We bring in an outsider. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of human resources professionals out there who um, do consulting work and specialize in these types of investigations. Pretty much any employment attorney will also conduct these types of investigations. Um, and that is an insurance policy that you just can't buy, right? Um, it's really tough when you're looking at this and you're saying, why do I, why am I going to pay somewhere between two hundred and four hundred dollars an hour for an investigation that I can conduct myself? The answer is that when you bring in somebody from outside, they have an air of cleanliness, right? The allegations that require an outsider really are the ones that impugn the integrity of the entire organization, right? Consider the Harvey Weinstein allegation, again, where, um, you know, these complaints that his subordinates knew not only everything he was doing, but they were facilitating it. They were setting up the meetings with these young actresses who were being called to his hotel room where he was making these inappropriate propositions. He was blacklisting actresses in Hollywood when people in his organization should have known that the Mira Sorvinos of the world, for example, were great actresses and really could do the work that he was saying they couldn't do. Uh, that black mark against the entire organization is going to invalidate an investigation that is done by by an inside member of the organization. Um, I will tell you that usually it is not true that the entire organization is rotten to the core, right? That's often not the case, but you don't want to have to fight that battle. It is worth it in time and money and expense and frustration to say, look, we're going to bring in an outsider. We're going to have this done right the first time, and we're not going to um, then have to deal with these allegations that the human resources manager couldn't investigate the CEO adequately because she was worried about losing her job, right? So once we have identified our outsider, um, and again, if you have employment counsel, they're great people to talk to because they can identify somebody for you. Your employment attorneys, the ones who represent your organization, generally will not do these investigations for you because it means that they can't defend you in subsequent litigation over that issue, right? If I investigate uh, an allegation against your organization, I become a witness, so I cannot then be your lawyer. Um, and so usually your employment attorneys will not do the investigation. They're going to say, hey, I know this really great HR professional, or I know a really great attorney. Let's bring them in and use them. So once our outsider is identified, cooperate in every possible way. They're going to uh, identify who your point person is, by the way, um, and that's going to be the person who manages this process. It's very often an HR professional, but it doesn't have to be if HR is the one accused. It could be your chief operations officer, your CEO. That can be the point person. Totally fine. Um, but identify the point person, give the investigator everything they want, every single email they're asking for, organizational charts your personnel and policies. Those are the types of things that are frequently asked, uh, asked for. Give them everything. Then request and implement recommendations. So remember when I was talking about your normal run of the, run of the mill investigations, I said, you know, provide guidance to those employees even if they didn't do anything unlawful, right? When you've got the types of high level allegations that require you to bring in an outside investigator, You've got something wrong, right? Um, there's some problem that has been allowed to fester. So ask this expert who is coming to your organization with fresh eyes, what do you see here? What are we doing that we could improve upon, right? It doesn't mean that you are bad people or that you've done a bad job running your business, but everybody's got a fresh perspective. So take advantage of that pr fresh perspective and say, what can we do? Um, how can we make ourselves better and avoid this problem going forward? Uh, sometimes it's things as simple as clarifying the chain of command. Uh, sometimes it's things as difficult as uh, improving the overall tenor of workplace interactions. That's a hard project, and it usually involves, you know, a 
substantial amount of training and interaction and regular monitoring, right? If you've got a practice of bullying going on in your business, that's a hard thing to stamp out. Um, and it takes a lot of work, but you need to ask for the insight of this outsider to, to really bring a fresh light to what's going on. So request and implement recommendations. And as I said earlier, remember that this is an insurance policy. If you bring in an outside investigator and they conduct an investigation and say, no, there was no unlawful harassment here, but here are three things you can do to improve the situation in your workplace. And then you implement those three things and document the fact that you've done so, it is going to be very difficult for an employee to undermine that process in litigation. That is a very strong legal defense that you have set up there. And I highly, highly encourage you to consider the value of that when you're talking about whether it's worth bringing in an outside investigator. All right, what do we do about untimely claims? This is an incredibly difficult situation, right? These are the Al Franken allegations, right? So uh, let's uh, look at a situation where we've got a sitting congressman who uh, was accused of doing inappropriate things before he became a congressman, right? Um, or the longtime CEO who is accused of having engaged in misconduct five or 10 years ago, right? So you had an employee who left on bad terms. Let's, let's assume that this employee was fired for poor performance. And five years later comes back and says, hey, by the way, I want you to know that your senior manager, who's now the CEO, uh, was inappropriate with me. He uh, touched my breast or he propositioned me for sexual favors. And then I didn't acquiesce and I was fired. That is an incredibly difficult situation to deal with. The question becomes, do we really need to care about something that this person did before they even worked for us? Do we need to care about something that happened five years ago when we've had no complaints from any other person? And the most complex issue is, of course, our, the, the story that I just told you where, you know, this was somebody who was fired for poor performance. They've got sour grapes, right? This is somebody who's got, a, who's got a, an ax to grind with your organization. Uh, the first thing I will say is that there's no statute of limitations on HR, right? Um, the shelf life on a charge of discrimination is fairly short. So if I... Uh, believes that I have been the victim of harassment, I need to go to the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the Delaware Department of Labor or whatever the enforcement agency is in my location, and I need to bring a claim within 300 days of the last unlawful incident. If I don't do that, then I can't really take action on the basis of that harassment anymore. There are lots of exceptions. There are lots of circumstances that I can talk about, but that's the general rule of thumb, 300 days at the outside. So you got a, a claim that's, you know, five years old. It's not really a valid legal claim, but that doesn't mean anything to you because you're HR professionals. You're not the EEOC. You're not a court of law. So this becomes more a question of business management than it does legal defense, right? I will tell you that from a business management perspective, I think that those allegations should be investigated and documented to the extent possible. And here's why. <clears throat> you could have a festering problem on your hands that you just weren't aware of, right? Um, as we saw with this Me Too campaign, one or two people came forward and suddenly the floodgates opened. And we had allegations going back five and 10 and you know 20 years in some cases. Uh, if you've got a festering problem on your hands, it is in your best interest to learn about it, figure it out, and address it, right? Um, it is possible that this individual who was, let's, let's say this is an assistant to a high-level manager, and she said, look, I was treated unfairly. I was propositioned for sexual favors, and when I refused, I uh, was terminated. Well, if your manager is still with the organization and has had two or three assistants since then, and each one is an attractive young lady or, you know, has 
um, you know, behaved in ways that you thought were maybe a little unusual, there, there tend to be red flags in these situations. And until you know that there's an issue, you don't see the red flag. Uh, so once you have this complaint, even if it's untimely, you start seeing some red flags. Um, and I think that it's worth exploring that so that you can defend the company in the best possible way in the long run. Consider interviewing non-witnesses, right? So our um, imaginary complainant who hasn't worked for the company for five years may identify witnesses for you that don't work for you anymore. And if that's the case, then you're really at a dead end, right? Talk to the people who are currently working for that manager. Ask them about their experiences. Assure them that they will not uh, face any retaliation if they tell you the truth. Uh, these are the people who are in the best position to really tell you what's going on. Now, maybe your former employee really just is uh, unloading because she has the opportunity and is seeing that, you know, this is a time when sexual harassment claims are being taken more seriously. Maybe this is all fabricated. Maybe every person who has worked for that manager since uh, this woman was fired it just loves the manager, has had nothing but fantastic experiences, not a bad word to say. Well, you know what? Then you know. That's, a, that's an outstanding outcome. That is a fantastic result to your investigation. But it's also possible that once you get behind closed doors with the, assist, the new assistant, she says, yeah, I've been treated in the same way. I don't like the way that he talks to me or she talks to me. Um, you know, let me take this moment for a little caveat. I've been talking about these situations as if they are always uh, involving men in power and female subordinates. That is not true. Um, women can engage in this type of harassment. Uh, men can harass men and women can harass women. So every iteration of these problems can exist. Um, I encourage you very strongly to not think about this uh, in the limited scope of men in power harassing women without power. It can be the opposite. It can be any number of situations. Um, but that is the hallmark of quid pro quo harassment is an individual in a position of power using that power to exert um, control over a subordinate to gain sexual favors. That is quid pro quo harassment, and that is what we're seeing so much of right now. Um, so investigate, consider interviewing non-witnesses, and develop a disciplinary plan um, for what, what you would do if the situation happened, right? You're going to balance a lot of considerations. One is the age of the claim. If this person is making allegations about something that happened two years ago, that's maybe a little bit more serious than something that happened 20 years ago. Um, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. But what are you going to do? Um, and then how severe it is, right? So if this was a couple of inappropriate jokes, then you maybe provide a little bit of guidance or training to the manager and say, hey, you know, I know you deny these allegations, but I just want to be very clear that that type of joking is not appropriate in the workplace. And if we get any additional allegations of this nature, you will be subject to further disciplinary action. That's the best possible scenario. The worst possible scenario is that you have an allegation of sexual assault, the Harvey Weinstein allegations, right? That I was raped, that I was touched against my will. Um, those are incredibly serious and warrant a much more significant uh, penalty if you can substantiate them. Um, and again, just because it's a he, a he said, she said doesn't mean that you can't substantiate the allegation, right? Almost always when you have allegations of sexual assault, one person is going to say, no, I didn't do it. And the other person is going to say, yes, I did. It's your job to make the tough call and decide who is telling the truth, if you can, and be consistent in addressing the allegations. All right. So there are two sort of unique situations that we see in these cases. And I'll touch very briefly on those and then we're going to be done. Uh, one is the chronic complainer, right? So you have a subordinate who, you know, just can't get along with anybody and all of a sudden they're bringing forward sexual harassment complaints or any other type of harassment complaint, really. Um, take, the, take the allegations seriously, investigate them and pursue disciplinary action, right? Just because you have a chronic complainer doesn't mean that they may not be telling the truth, right? You've got to get to the bottom of it and make an objective determination on your own. 
Um, the much more insidious problem is the hider. This is the person who comes forward and says, well, I'm not going to tell you everything that happened, or I have these documents, but I'm not going to show them to you. This happens more often than you would think, and it is incredibly frustrating to deal with, right? So they refuse to identify documents or witnesses. They refuse to turn over their own notes. This is a classic. I've been keeping a journal of every single thing that my manager said to me that was inappropriate. And you say, that's you know, unfortunate that you felt that that was necessary. Please show me the journal so that I can investigate every single allegation. They say, no, 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 I'm not going to show that to you. Uh, keeping secrets for others. So there are three other people who have also been harassed, but I'm not going to give you their names. I'm, I'm not going to break their confidence uh, or saving complaints for later. You know, there were some other things that were done to me, but I don't feel like talking about them yet. None of those things is acceptable, right? Um, you need to be very clear with anybody who comes to you that they have a duty and a legal obligation to tell you every witness, to show you every document, to disclose every incident so that you can investigate it and remediate the situation. This is harder than it sounds because you're walking a fine line, right? You don't want to bully these individuals. Um, but at the same time, they can't save ammunition for their lawsuit. And that's really what they're doing. I will tell you from personal experience <laughs> that very frequently you see these allegations turn up later in litigation. Um, of course, you can't pull somebody's fingernails to, to make them share information with you. Um, so what do you do? You say to them, you know, we can't stop harassing behavior that we don't know about. We can't protect victims that we don't know about. So I'm going to strongly encourage you to share this information, right? And if they say no, then you document that meticulously, right? You uh, have them sign a statement, if possible, that says I, there are additional victims, but I won't tell you, or I have additional evidence, but I won't show it to you. Because that information is going to come up again, and you need to be able to explain why it is that you didn't pursue it. Um, so that is, uh, you know, a, a summary of some of the more complex issues that we're dealing with in this uh, realm right now. Um, I would welcome any questions uh, either now or by email at a later date uh, if you have them. And with that, I think I'll turn, a, turn everything back over to Catherine. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, uh, we did have some questions come in, so um, I'd like to share uh, some of those questions that did come in. Um, so the first uh, question that came in was this. Um, uh, the first question was this. I know you said that we can have a separate sexual harassment policy. Are there any drawbacks to that approach? Um, as, as I noted in the slide, consistency is, is, is a concern there. Uh, it is certainly my practice and preference to have everything combined in one policy. Um, but if a two policy system works for your organization, then that's certainly acceptable. But the, the key drawback is going to be uh, consistency across those policies. You've got to be very careful. Okay. All right. Good. Um, okay. So we had a second question. It was about uh, management. So. Um, how do we go about getting buy-in from management? So if we're trying to get buy-in from management, how do we go about getting that? Mm -hmm. um, so that's an excellent question, and it's easy in some cases and hard in others. Uh, there are some managers who you know, feel deeply about these issues, and that's an easy discussion to be had. Uh, there are also a lot of managers who are not going to take the problem seriously until it starts impacting their bottom line. And with those uh, individuals, I would encourage you to find any of the hundreds of lists online of uh, the settlements that have been reached in these sexual harassment cases. They are mind boggling. Um, Gretchen Carlson uh, reached a substantial settlement with Fox News, for example. It's a little tough because, you know, these are high profile cases with really severe allegations. Uh, in her case, it was the harassment by Roger Ailes. I think her settlement was something along the lines of $20 million, and she never had to file, uh, you know, never had to get to a jury to get that money. Um, but 
you know, on a daily basis, we're seeing settlements in the range of a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on severe cases. So you don't have to be a Gretchen Carlson to really hit a company's bottom line. So I'd share those stories with your managers if they're not taking this seriously. Okay, good. Um, and we had a third question. Um, is it really fair to discipline someone for something that happened 20 years ago, especially if we haven't had any other issues with them? That That is always the question, right? Should you have to uh, leave Congress because of something that happened five or 10 years ago? Should you be fired from uh, your position as an executive with a major multinational corporation because of bad behavior? Um, and, that's a question that you're going to have to deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. There are some situations where people have truly learned their lesson, right? Um, you know, they uh, were young and reckless and did horrible things that they deeply regret. And in those cases, maybe they shouldn't lose their job. But you also have the simmering cauldron situation that I was talking about, where, you know, the allegation is five or 10 or 20 years old, but you then find out that there has been inappropriate conduct happening in the intervening time. And so I would say that um, it's very important to look at these questions critically and make a decision about whether or not you've got a bigger problem on your hands that you just didn't know existed. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, thank you. So we have our contact information for Lauren here on the screen. So thank you so much to Lauren for giving this really timely uh, webinar for our attendees. And um, really, it's very, very interesting. So thank you so much, um, Lauren. And uh, so we have our contact information uh, for any questions. And uh, you can also send us questions here at First Healthcare Compliance, and we can forward them on to uh, Lauren Russell. Uh, you can also register for any future webinars with us um, or register for a demo of our compliance solution on our website, which is firsthcc.com, or call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you so much, Lauren. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, attendees. Thank you.